thank you so much, Pamela, Jane, and David, for organizing this fantastic conference. Dear friends and colleagues, uh, the relationship between screen media and ADHD symptoms, it's complicated. Today, I hope to offer you some insights into the state of the art of this research stream. And before doing so, uh, I would like to share with you a quote from a well-known Dutch artist. Her name is Rineke Dijkstra. Do you know Rineke Dijkstra? She's a Dutch photographer of uh, children and young people, and her work can be found in museums all over the world. These are typical examples of her work. A while ago, Dijkstra make, made an observation which struck my eye because it's so relevant to our work. She said, it has only been five years or so that I've noticed that people, and young people in particular, seem to have two faces. A private face that reveals how they really feel and a public face which they use to present themselves to the outside world and bring to perfection on YouTube and Facebook. <laughs> Only it seems like this public face is becoming increasingly important, as if putting it on has become an instinct, almost like an evolutionary development that enables people to survive in today's society. Dijkstra. This quote basically involves two observations. First, she observed that young people have changed. And second, she observed that screen media plays a role in this change. Uh, have young generations changed in the past decades? This uh, question has been addressed in so-called cross-temporal meta-analysis. And a cross-temporal meta-analysis Compare the, compares the scores of similar age people, for example, adolescents, uh, on standardized psychological tests in different time periods. Um, what do these cross-temporal meta-analyses reveal? Here are some examples. Dozens of studies have found that the intelligence scores of adolescents and college uh, students have increased over time. And this increase has been named the Flynn effect after James Flynn, who, uh, James Flynn, who was the first researcher who observed this increase in intelligence in different countries. But there are more examples, some others. Self-esteem among young people also have seemed to increase as of the 1980s for both children and college students, according to studies led by Jean ADHD is a more difficult case. A study by Newsom and colleagues found that newer generations are more restless, impulsive and rebellious. But the overall evidence is not conclusive. What is beyond doubt, however, is a sharp increase in ADHD diagnosis and prescription medication, as Dimitri has already observed this morning. As of the 1980s, there has been an almost eightfold increase of ADHD diagnosis in the US. What these three examples have in common is that these changes in children and teens have been attributed to screen media. And that's Dijkstra's second observation. Yes. A meta-analysis of Casey Powers and colleagues have shown that playing, food, uh, playing video games uh, is related to intelligence, and especially the visual and problem-solving forms of intelligence. And yes, most studies, including our own, have demonstrated that social media use by teens is related to their self-esteem. We don't know exactly what's the cause and the effect, but there are several studies who have shown a positive relationship between self-esteem and social media use. And for the relationship between screen media use and ADHD, I will 
turn to our own meta-analysis, which has been published in Developmental Psychology last year. Uh, in this uh, meta-analysis, we focused on uh, ADHD behaviors uh, as a composite, but we se also separately focused on attention problems, on hyperactivity and impulsivity. And the outcome of the meta-analysis, uh, we focused on TV and games and on general media use and violent media use. And we found for impulsivity, uh, uh, it's based on only seven effect sizes, an R of 0.11. And for ADHD composite, so a combination of attention problems, impulsivity and uh, hyperactivity, it's based on 43 effect sizes. We found 45 studies focusing on media, screen media use and ADHD uh, symptoms. And we found for the ADHD composite score a uh, pooled R of 0.12. And now a pivotal question. This is a small effect. How should we interpret these small effects? Should we take them seriously? You probably, many of you probably know there's currently a fierce debate going on among media violence researchers uh, on the relevance of effect sizes like this. Firstly, are, so, are such small effect sizes atypical or typical in our discipline? And I can show you. Uh, we recently <coughs> compared exemplary meta-analysis of media effects in our field in an article for the annual review of psychology. And here you see some examples. Um, the first is ADHD, our own meta-analysis. Uh, television viewing on uh, body fat leads to an R of 0.08. The effect of media violence on aggression, a meta-analysis of Craig Anderson and colleagues, lead to an R of 0.19. The effect of scary TV on fear to an R of 0.18 and the composite effects of advertising on children to an R of 0.50. Effect sizes of media use typically lie between 0.10 and 0.20. And they are usually small and rarely moderate or large. So... Where do we go from here? <coughs> we see media influencing kids' behavior every place we look. We see our whole society changing as a function of media. But we find only small media effects. It's time for some closer <laughs> analysis of these seemingly counterintuitive findings, and it's time some, for some disciplinary self-reflection. And in the remainder of my presentation, um, I'm going to discuss how we can further improve media effects theory and research. And I will discuss three challenges for media effects research with a focus on ADHD symptoms. The first challenge and, um, involves our media exposure measures, and I agree with Michael uh, that measuring media uh, exposure is extremely difficult, and especially among kids. For children and teens, you have to come up with very concrete questions, and that's impossible if the tools are changing all the time. And because of this, it's, uh, media exposure measures can easily lead to unreliable uh, measures, unreliable results. And we all know that if we have unreliable results, this can lead to an attenuation of effect sizes, small effect sizes. So effects can become smaller due to unreliable measures. But it's even more important that um, the most important problem with um, exposure measures is that uh, too many researchers often fail to use theory-based exposure measures. And that's also what Michael Rich told us this morning. And I will give you an example. Uh, in our meta-analysis, we were able to retrace 45 studies 
on the media ADHD <coughs> relationship, as I told you. In the theoretical parts of these studies, the potential effect of media on ADHD is often, most often attributed to either the rapid, hectic nature of contemporary entertainment or to its violent nature. But how is media use mostly measured? Through a single item, how many hours per week does your child watch television? <laughs> this is a very inadequate measure. We know already from the 1970s that single item measures for media exposure are unreliable. But they are even more unreliable in the case of ADHD, ADHD symptoms, and why? We all know that very young children already differ greatly in their preferences for media content. Some of them like fast-paced and violent cartoons and others not. And if you combine all these different preferences and so all these different children into one unreliable crude measure, um, you will get uh, unreliable results with such insensitive measures. But it's still the most commonly used measure of media exposure. Um, in our uh, research project, which I'm going to show now, but I see, oh yeah, it's a bit unclear, yeah. Um, we have measured media use through media diaries. We asked parents of children in the ages of three to seven years to keep a media diary uh, in, uh, of their kids' media use for four days. And I have to tell you, it took us, um, it took us um, one year per data wave to code all these media uh, diaries. And in, in hindsight, I can tell you that I would not recommend them anymore. And I. <laughs> and I will tell you, if you're interested, why I will tell you later on uh, in, uh, in my, um, uh, after the presentation. But first, res some results based on these uh, media diaries. This graph, is, uh, this graph is based on a cross-sectional data from um, uh, 80, uh, 865 kids. And what do you see is that for boys, we found again a small relationship between uh, overall media use, this is a uh, graph on overall media use, and ADHD um, symptoms. But for girls, we found a non-significant non -significant downward trend. So we found, an, uh, we found an effect of overall media use, uh, but only for boys. And here you see um, results based on the content. <coughs> and again, you see for boys, that uh, exposure to violent TV use leads to more ADHD uh, symptoms. And for um, girls, you don't find any significant relationship. And the results uh, were the same for scary TV use. And as expected, we did not find any relationship or, uh, of educational TV for uh, ADHD symptoms. So content counts. That's clear from this study. A second uh, challenge uh, is that we need to recognize transic transactional media effects, transactional models. Transactional effect means that outcomes of media use can also influence this media use. And transactional uh, effects are very plausible for outcomes that are close to children's <coughs> identity and uh, ADHD symptoms and aggression are close to children's identity. Of uh, the 45 studies in our meta-analysis, very few have considered transactional effects and none of the longitudinal studies. Um, here you see a three-wave longitudinal studies in which we modeled ADHD symptoms, general media use and violent media use on wave year one, year two, year three. We me measured all these variables in three subsequent years. And this um, study is based on 1,032 uh, children, 14, 10 to 14 years old, and the paper's under review at the moment. And what you see is that media use does not lead longitudinal to ADHD behaviors, 
and violent media use, small effect again, leads to ADHD. But what we also see is that reciprocal effects are even more convincing. ADHD use leads to general ADHD symptoms, children <coughs> leads to general media use, but also to violent media use. So what you see uh, is that we always assume that television may lead to ADHD, but it's also ADHD children who are, tr are more than other children attracted to certain types of television viewing, and in this case, violent television, and not to educational television viewing. The third and final challenge, we need to pay more attention to differential susceptibility to media effects. We need to acknowledge that media effects are conditional, that they do not equally hold for all children. Differential susceptibility to media effects is, in my view, the most plausible cause for the small correlations that we repeatedly find in large and heterogeneous samples. And here you see a quote that supports my view. And I'm curious if you are able to guess the author and date of this quote. And the person who can gets a beer of me tonight. <laughs> that the movies exert an influence, there can be no doubt. But it's our opinion that this influence is specific for a given child and a given movie. The same picture may influence children, different children in distinctly opposite directions. Thus, in a general survey, as such we have made, the net effects appear small. Pain fund studies. Who said it? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that the senior scholars among us know their classics. <laughs> but for those who don't know the pain fund studies, this quote dates from 1933. Mind you, 1933, and this is the original quote, this is at the heyday of behaviorism. Such a balanced view at the heyday of behaviorism. It's, it's um, the summary of the pain fund studies, and I could retrace it, and I'm very proud that I, uh, that I have it. Um, in our field, um, conditional media effects are rapidly becoming mainstream. And this trend parallels those in other disciplines, uh, such as personalized medicine, personalized learning, differential susceptibilities, which all call for a more personalized approach to research. And you may have heard of the orchid dandelion hypothesis. I see the psychologists have heard of it in developmental <laughs> psychology. And that um, hypothesis assumes that most children are like dandelions. They thrive in positive social environments, and in negative ones. But there is a small percentage of children who are more like orchids. And these kids, they blossom far better than the dandelions in positive environments, but in negative environments, they wilt or fade. What do these theories have in common? Um, they all uh, theorize or investigate the interaction between one or more <coughs> person-based factors, such as um, uh, temperament or genetic factors, and one environmental factor, factors, such as a drug or a vitamin or parenting behavior or uh, family or media violence. However, researchers now start to realize that we need even more complex comprehensive models to understand social behavior. And this is an example of an OPET in science that emphasizes that personalized medicine should be social medicine. The point of the writer is that we need more complex models to understand the development of certain disorders and behaviors. So we need more complex models, more comprehensive models. Now we recently, recently, a few years ago, we developed such a complex model, and it's called the differential susceptibility 
to media effects model. And uh, in our model, we identify three types of susceptibility to media effects dispositional susceptibility, developmental and social susceptibility. And dispositional susceptibility refers to stable um, and transient dispositions, for example, mood as a transient one, and genes or personality, temperament as more stable dispositional factors. Developmental is children's and adults' uh, cognitive and social-emotional level. And social is a broad ca category, it can involve family and peer influence, parenting styles, and media-specific parenting. How do we conceptualize these three types of susceptibility in our model? Let me explain. Based on our previous research, we believe that the three susceptibility factors all predispose uh, <coughs> media use. Yeah, so, for example, children with an aggressive temperament are more inclined to use violent media. But these, these same factors also moderate the effects of media use on children's processing of media. And this may seem odd at first sight, but it's actually quite plausible. Let me explain. For example, children high, children high in trait aggression are more likely to prefer violent media content. But these children can also process violent media differently. For example, they can feel less empathy with victims, or they can interpret uh, ambiguous non-violent acts as violent. So an aggressive temperament can predispose media use, but can also change the effects of media use. Another example, a uh, parent can stimulate media use by, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, educational media, but they can also scaffold, to sc scaffolding can also increase the effects of educational media, increase the effect of educational. And they can uh, restrict media, media, for example, violent media, but they can also um, decrease effects of violent media, for example, on fear, on ADHD behavior, or, or aggression. And in the past years, we have tested uh, this model in several studies, and here you see an example of dispositional susceptibility. And um, for this study, we collaborated um, with uh, researchers, uh, pediatricians in uh, Rotterdam, and this study is based on a cohort study called Generation R, and R stands for Rotterdam. And um, we focused on uh, a candidate polymorphism that has been related to ADHD symptoms in earlier studies, the 5-HTT polymorphism. And what we uh, found uh, is um, that the, this uh, um, polymorphism was not related to ADHD symptoms. But what we did find is that it was related to violent media use and uh, violent media use was in turn related to ADHD uh, behavior. And contrary to our expectations, the 5-HTT uh, uh, polymorphism did not moderate the effects of violent media use on ADHD symptoms, but it could, of course, be possible that other candidate uh, genes uh, can moderate this relationship. And as you see, the effects we found were, again, very small. And um, the effects of the polymorphism was actually smaller than that of media. And that we now know that the effects of candidate genes are um, often smaller than that of media research. And it's good to relativize this. Right? It's interesting that, that these effects are even smaller. <laughs> and uh, other um, example uh, on social susceptibility. Uh, here we tested whether restrictive mediation, restrictive media-specific parenting would decrease media effects on ADHD symptoms. And as some of you uh, know, the literature on restrictive mediation is fairly inconsistent. Some studies have found that restriction is effective, others found no effect, and again others found boomerang effects, effects opposite to the ones intended. 
And we know that especially uh, teens, uh, among teens, parental restriction can lead to psychological reaction and to uh, effects opposite than the ones intended. And uh, so um, uh, how our hypothesis was that, um, um, that these inconsistent results can be due to the fact that there are different types of restriction. Parents can restrict in many different ways. So we imported, uh, we, um, so we um, um, created the scale uh, the, with which we could, uh, it's published here in Human Communication Research, in which we could measure three types of restriction. Controlling restriction, in which parents use punishment or threat or guilt induction, inconsistent uh, restriction in which, which they uh, on one day say you are allowed to watch violent TV and the other day it's not allowed, for example, when uh, they, it's allowed when there are visitors or something like that. And autonomy supportive restriction, and that is being restrictive, but also taking the child's perspective seriously. And what we found is quite interesting. We found that, as expected, Autonomy-supported restriction led to less media violent use. And as you see, inconsistent restriction led to the opposite result. And that is uh, consistent with the general parenting literature. Uh, inconsistent parenting is by far the most detrimental uh, parenting style for child development. Uh, contrary to our expectation, we also found a small negative effect for controlling uh, restriction. And we now think that these kids were 10 to 14 years. And we think that this psychological reaction, if it happens, it will occur when, will occur, occur when children are somewhat older. So this is our... To conclude, uh, we see that differential susceptibility perspective is rapidly gaining prominence in our field and I'm very, very pleased with that development. And I want to finish my talk with a com commentary of mine uh, in response to a meta-analysis of Christopher Ferguson on media use and different outcomes, including ADHD symptoms. And my commentary and his meta-analysis appeared in perspective uh, in psychological science two weeks ago. And in this uh, commentary, I plead for a more constructive debate on the effects of violent media on children and adolescents. We now have seen that even the earliest studies tell us that children can react quite differently to the same media content. And in my view, if we really we truly want to understand how media affects children rather than fight for the presence or absence of small effects. We need to adopt a perspective that takes differential susceptibility to media effects more seriously. Thank you. Um, if you're <laughs>